You can head out and upstairs. Let's hear it one more time for Kaipo, Bobby, and his son, Adam. You have to what? Oh, that's okay. I'll take care of it. So, uh, welcome. My name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor here at International. Very thankful that you were with us this morning for Ohana Christmas. Um, Every Sunday, we're kind of guaranteed, we always want to do what we call the three W's. We're going to have a time of welcoming, being with together. We have a time of worship, which a little bit we've done. We're going to have some more after. And then we always take a little bit of time from the Word. As God's people, we want to build our lives on the Word of God. So we're going to turn our attention to that for the next few minutes. And as we do, would you please pray with me? Lord God, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this entire season, God, this Christmas time when we remember and reflect that this is the time many, many years ago when you stepped out of heaven and became a human being, that you incarnated yourself. You took on the human experience. So, Lord, you can identify with us perfectly. As we turn our attention to your word, Lord, would you speak to us? Would you hide me behind your cross, God? Anything I say, may it be from you. Would you encourage our, our hearts with your mind, or sorry, with your word? Would you uh, speak to our mind uh, as well, God? Uh, the things we hear, we would understand. And Lord, would we also be people who put it into practice? So we wouldn't be hearers of your word, but we'd be doers also. I pray this in your name. Amen. I will never forget all the diarrhea Yes, there was so much of it, people, and there was so much of it all the time. Now, it wasn't mine, thankfully, but I had to deal with it, which I didn't enjoy, because I didn't even know what a normal poopy diaper looked like, and the reason I didn't know is because when my oldest daughter, the blonde one who was dancing about here, uh, when she was a baby, she never had a normal diaper. From the time we gave her solids on, it... uh, was clearly not getting digested properly. And then there was the vomit. I didn't even mention that. Oh, sometimes it would come out the other end. It seemed about every month or so, every few weeks, uh, she would just have these puking cycles. And she'd be playing with her toys. She would, I called it, chew backwards. And then she would go on playing with her toys as if something really gross didn't just take place in our living room. She just keep going on like, what is this? So she didn't seem sick, but we just didn't know what happened. And my poor wife had to deal with most of it because I'm a, I'm a sympathetic vomiter. So if I see somebody doing it, I'm like, hey, that looks like fun. Let me join you. Um, it's just not good. So my wife had to deal with it most of the time. Now, after pursuing some answers to this medically for over a year... Uh, We finally arrived at a diagnosis, and that is that Olivia was the first case in Colorado with a very rare genetic disorder called congenital sucrase isomaltase deficiency, which I have no idea what that means, but they tell me that means that there's certain sugars she can't digest. She does not have the enzymes, enough of the enzymes, uh, sucrase and isomaltase, to break down those sugars. Now, those two sugars are incredibly common. So it meant that kind of when we were trying different brands, different foods, everything had some kind of a sugar that she couldn't tolerate. So this is what was causing the problems at both ends. Now, the answer, they told us, was that she needed a very restrictive diet. It meant that our shopping was going to have to switch from Walmart to Whole Foods, or as I call it, Whole Paycheck. Golly. There were all kinds of special grains. She needed these different kinds of flours. She needed different breads, fruits, certain vegetables. That was all going to have to change because sucrose was in almost all of it. And now there is a bottle of medication we could get. Uh, It's called Sucrate. It was something she could take with her food to help her digest the stuff better. And that bottle cost $6,000 for one month's supply. Yeah, I was in seminary full time. I was working part-time at a church for $5 an hour. Uh, My wife was a server at Outback, and we were on Medicaid, so that wasn't going to happen. And we just felt super overwhelmed by all this. We we weren't sure what we were going to do. We feared that we couldn't afford to adjust to the health changes 
that were going to be necessary. We didn't know what these new things were going to mean for us. We just we felt overwhelmed. We felt we felt scared. Honestly. You ever felt that way? Had something thrown at you? Felt overwhelmed? You felt scared? You're like, I, this is going to change things, and I don't know what to do. Ever been in that spot? I'm sure, I'm sure you have. It's a pretty common human experience to feel that overwhelmness, that, that fear that something externally is happening that you can't control and you don't know where to turn or what to do. Well, what do you do in those moments when you have them? Where, where do you tend to turn for help? Where do you put your place, your hope at that time? Now, for many of us, I think we had such a communal moment about two years ago. You remember this? Yeah? Remember when for a second we thought we were all going to die? Because ballistic missile threat was inbound to Hawaii? Seek shelter immediately. This is not a drill. Uh, man, I was standing right there when we got that on a Saturday morning. We were just starting demolition on the uh, interior sanctuary in here. And this, a friend of mine actually took this photo on his phone. He had enough presence of mind to go, well, if I survive, <laughs> this, will, this will make for a good memento. I mean, I remember that feeling of just suddenly suddenly being informed that a threat was coming our way. How did you respond that day, for those of you who were on island? What did you do? Where did your thoughts go? Where did you place your hope in that moment? See, when we are threatened, what we believe becomes evident. Not what we say we believe, but what we actually believe becomes perfectly evident when we are threatened, when something outside is pressuring us, what is really important will become clear when we're overwhelmed. Now, we're going to see this today as well when we look at the life of a man named King Hezekiah. Then we're going to look at how he responded to a dire situation that he was facing. Now, if you haven't been with us over the last uh, few weeks, you might not know this, but each season of Advent, kind of the four Sundays that precede Christmas, we kind of pick a theme each year to approach Christmas kind of from this particular lens or angle. And this year, we're looking at the fathers of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 1, he begins his, gene his uh, gospel with a genealogy, kind of going through Jesus' ancestors. So we're looking at some of the stories of those ancestors, and how do they point us toward Christ. So we had King David uh, last week, we had Abraham the first week, and now we'll turn to King Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah is not one of those guys we know a ton about. Pastors like to make lame jokes telling you to turn to Hezekiah 2.14, which you can do now if you'd like. Ha <laughs> there is no Hezekiah. <laughs> Pastors get a, a, a kick out of that one. Outside of that, we really don't get Hezekiah too often. Who is this guy? What do we know about him? What did he do? What has he got to do with Christmas? Well, Hezekiah was a direct descendant of King David, whom we heard about last week. Now, King David uh, died. He left the throne to his son, Solomon. All right, Solomon, another famous guy, wisest man who ever lived, supposedly. I don't know how a wise man thinks 700 wives is better than one wife. Sounds crowded to me. Nonetheless, he's considered one of the wisest who ever lived. And his kingdom, he took Israel really into its golden age. But he made some decisions, including the 700 wives stuff, that really took him and started to take the kingdom of Israel off track in his later years. Now, Solomon died and his son Rehoboam took over. Rehoboam was a bit of a nitwit. Uh, Rehoboam managed to tick off 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel so greatly that those 10 tribes are like, you know what, we're going to go make our own country. And that left Judah and Benjamin in the south. They're like, you can have your own country. You be Judah. We're now Israel up north. And the people in the south are like, no, you're not Israel. We're going to call you Samaria. So you'll sometimes hear them refer to as Samaria. So that's the people up north. So the kingdom splits. The kings after that, so Rehoboam's kind of a bad guy. Uh, after him, his son is also a bad king. His son is a bad king. Then you get a good king, good, bad, 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 mixed, mixed, good, good, 
very bad. Anybody heard of Jezebel and Ahaz? Very bad. And then they have a son, those two together, named Hezekiah. And this is what we read about Hezekiah in the book of 2 Kings chapter 18. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Notice not his father Ahaz, but like, hey, this guy is a lineage that traces all the way back to David. He's like David. He removed the high places. He smashed the sacred stones. He cut down the Asherah poles. Those were all places of worship to false gods in their territory that the bad kings had erected and allowed to stand. Hezekiah broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made, for at, up to that time, Israelites had been burning incense to it. It was called Nehushtan. So Hezekiah is a good king. He's breaking down altars, things that people are worshiping and following more than God. He's trying to turn people's hearts back to Yahweh. He's as good as it gets in the Old Testament, and that's not for me. That's actually what verse 5 says. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord. He did not stop following him. He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. Then we get this sentence. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. Now, Assyria, if we go back to this time, Assyria is the big bully on the Middle Eastern bloc at this point in time. They are remembered uh, in history as having a, a very large militaristic empire whose success is, at least in very large part, maybe not entirely, but at least in large part attributed to their violence. The Assyrians were known as being incredibly cruel and vicious in their conquests. Yes, they had impressive diplomatic, administrative, and economic prowess, to be sure. However, their main tool in expanding their kingdom was just sheer ruthlessness. What the Assyrians would do is they would come into a territory, and they would pick a few select cities, and they would attack them, and they would just completely eviscerate them. I mean, just destroy them entirely. One Assyrian general, he liked to skin all of the captives alive from every city he took. Then he would burn them from the bottoms, from their feet up. But just before they would die, he would then decapitate them. Cities would be torched to the ground. Every male in a city would be impaled. Every woman and child would either be burned or they would be taken off as slaves. The heads of the rulers of those towns, they would hang them from trees around the city in order to serve as a warning to neighboring tribes and kingdoms. I mean, really? And that's like the stuff I felt like I could say on a Sunday morning. It was cruel. This is the group of people when Jonah is being told, hey, I want you to go preach in Nineveh. Some of you might know that story with the whale and the fish and the swallowed up. He's like, I don't want to go tell them. These are the people he's talking about. God, they're too vicious. They're too cruel. They don't deserve your goodness. So what they would do is they would come out, they would pick out some of these cities, they would just stomp them, just crush it. And then they would send out messengers surrounding to the surrounding territory, to the other cities, and they would offer to spare those cities in exchange for hefty, regular tribute or taxes, and a submission to the king of Assyria. And many, many smaller nations were willing to pay that price. So that's how Assyria expanded their territory. Judah had been paying that tribute. Judah had been willing to say, yeah, no, don't crush us. Here's all the gold and the silver we have. They'd been sending tribute to the Assyrians, to Shalmaneser V was the big king that you can read about earlier in, in 2 Kings. But at this point, Hezekiah, someday, we don't exactly know why, but he gets bold. It might have something to do with the fact that they were out of money. It says that they had actually already stripped God's temple of all the gold and sent it off to Assyria. We're not told exactly why, but for some reason, 
Hezekiah gets bold. He goes, yeah, Assyria, we're done. I'm claiming independence. We're not going to pay you the tribute anymore. Now, funny enough, their cousins to the north, all right, that was the Samaria Israel tribes, they had also told Assyria, hey, we're done. We're not paying you anymore. But they were not following Yahweh. They were not following God. They are known as being wicked. In case you're wondering about like what their king lineage looked like, all bad. There was no good king in the north. It was just disaster from beginning to end. And God says, hey, if you guys don't shape up, I'm going to let Assyria come in and wipe you out. And they don't shape up. So God allows the king of Assyria to bring his army in and to take out the northern territory to conquer Israel in the north. Now, the king at that time is named Sennacherib, and Sennacherib gets greedy. Sennacherib decides, you know what? Your God has given me Israel, but I'm not content with just taking Israel. I'm coming for Judah, too. So Sennacherib says, I am coming for Jerusalem. I am heading south. So they dispatched a military leader as was their custom, to head ahead of them to the gates of Jerusalem. Now, this guy's job was to threaten Hezekiah and scare the people of Jerusalem as much as he could. All right, so we read in 2 Kings 18, verse 28, this commander comes and he stood and he called out in Hebrew. That's fascinating. He knew the local dialect of what to speak. This, again, was an Assyrian military tactic. They would send out people who knew local dialects. They didn't speak just the Aramaic. That was the the language that they spoke in terms of politics and in sort of the economic language of the territory. No, they sent somebody who could speak Hebrew, somebody who could speak to the commoners so that everybody on that wall and within that gate and near the town center could understand what he was saying. And here's what he says in Hebrew. Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you from my hand. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, The Lord surely will deliver us. Oh, this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. What has any, has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? See what he's doing there? He's going, hey, your Yahweh God is nothing. He's just like every other God of every other nation that we have conquered. You're nothing special, Judah. We're coming for you. Imminent threat inbound. Seek shelter immediately. This is not a drill. Assyria is coming. Now, inside the walls of Jerusalem, there's a prophet, a man of God named Isaiah. And Isaiah goes to King Hezekiah, and he says, Hey, Hezekiah, don't listen to that schmuck. Do not listen to him. God will defend Jerusalem. God will protect his people. Do not give in to the fear that you are feeling, and do not give in to the king of Assyria. Stay strong. I'm sure that was easy to say and hard to do because Assyria kept marching. Assyria was even kind enough to send a follow-up letter. Uh, Hey, we just want to make sure you received our war, Graham. They send a letter mocking Yahweh, the God of Israel, even more. In this letter, they're disparaging King Hezekiah, and they are once again threatening all of Jerusalem. They're threatening him, trying to develop this fear in the city. So what will Hezekiah do? What would you do if you were him? How would you respond? You're out of money, so you can't really pay him off. You could maybe enslave yourselves, but that's probably not going to go very well based on Assyrian reputation. He hears the threats. He feels the fear. He is overwhelmed. What should he do? Should he maybe try and get help from another nation? His dad had already tried that with Egypt, and that totally backfired. Maybe you should go out and battle them, right? Stick to the man. At least go down on your feet. Well, that is not going to go well because... (laughs) Assyria is marching toward them with an army of at least 200,000 men. There's probably only about 2,500 men in Jerusalem at the time. What's Hezekiah to do? Where's he going to go for help? 
Where's his trust when he is threatened and really threatened? Well, we read how he responds in 2 Kings 19, beginning in verse 15. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. Lord, the God of Israel enthroned between the cherubim, which means the the angels, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words that Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them. But they were not real gods, but only of wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. Hezekiah is not very uh, multicultural. (laughs) He's not very pluralistic or inclusive uh, in this prayer. It's not a, a very 21st century PC prayer. He believes Yahweh alone is God. And that he is different from any other deity in any other place. There is no one like him. Everything else is a lie. God alone, Hezekiah says, is the maker of heaven and earth. He alone is sovereign over all of it. What deep, rich understanding and theology Hezekiah has here about God. He doesn't just believe in God. He is somebody who believes God. He believes God when he says that he rules over the whole earth. He believes God when he says, I care for my people. I will come. I will protect you. That's why Hezekiah trusts him. That's why Hezekiah runs to him. When we're threatened, what we really believe comes out. When you squeezed Hezekiah, trust in God is what came out. He didn't trust in other kings. He didn't put his trust in armies, in power, or in money. He didn't even put his trust in himself. He didn't trust his own leadership or his own strength. Now, Hezekiah, when he didn't know what to do, he started a Bible study. He put his hope in God because he believed that God was the highest authority in the universe, not Sennacherib. Hear the words of the king, the great king of Assyria? Oh, no, 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 no. There's only one great king, and his name is Yahweh. And so he prays and he asks God to come down and to rescue his people from calamity because he believed, I think, that really at this point, only God can save them from this giant mess. Nothing else is going to do it. So he puts his faith in the Lord to save him and his people. So what's God going to do? How is God going to respond? Does he care about his people? Does he care about evil rulers who go beyond the borders of what he told them they'd be allowed to do? We can read God's response in 2 Kings 19, 32 through 36, speaking through Isaiah. Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend it and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. Verse 35, that night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. This is a true story. This is not a fable. This actually happened. God came down and decimated the Assyrian Army. There are actually other historical documents that we have found, that we find in, in Nineveh that they've dug up, where uh, Sennacherib and Shalmaneser talk about going down to Judah. And they talk about trying to besiege Judah. And 
then they talk about coming back home. <laughs> the, the writings, even in the Assyrian writings, admit that they besieged but never quite conquered Jerusalem. Of course, those historical records don't mention the loss of life, but that also was completely normal. That's not something, if you think you're the greatest king on the planet, that you're going to record in your history books. But what is recorded is that they went down and left without taking the city, and that almost never happened to Assyria. Now, it talks about the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000. Who is this angel of the Lord? Well, the, angel talks, uh, the Bible talks about angels, about messengers. Uh, they're created beings by God. We don't know exactly how they work, everything they do, where they come from. The Bible doesn't give us a whole origin story, but it just tells us that they are there. And sometimes it talks about angels, angels of the Lord. Sometimes we'll talk about an angel of the Lord. There are a handful of instances in the Old Testament where it says the angel of the Lord appeared. The, a singular one, shows up on the scene. And when he does, usually something fascinating happens. The angel of the Lord speaks and acts for God in the first person. For example... We all know Moses, the story in the burning bush, he comes and encounters God, and God talks to him and tells him what's up. Well, in Exodus 3, 2, it says the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a burning bush and spoke with Moses. Right? The angel of the Lord regularly appears and seems to at least have quite the liberty in communication to speak as if that angel of the Lord is God himself coming down from heaven. I think that's the case. I think the, the overwhelming evidence is that this is God who says, I will come down and defend the city. I'm, I'm not going to hand this off to an angel. This is priority number one. No senior VP is going to take care of this. I got it. I am coming down. He humbles Assyria. He defends his people. He shows that who is the king of kings who is the sovereign ruler of all? Who is higher than Assyria? There is only one whose kingdom is total and whose reign is final, and that is him. All kingdoms, all other kingdoms come and go. Only God rules forever. All other kingdoms come and go. Only God rules forever. Hezekiah believed this, and God proved this. If I ask again, in what power do you trust? Not what you say you trust, but where do you actually trust? When life's squeezing you, where do you turn? Where do you look? When you receive bad news, where do you look for the solution to your problems? Google? Where do you place your hope for help? Is it in an earthly kingdom? Is it in human power? Is it in your own ability? Is it in society? You're trusting that your community is never going to let you down? Are you trusting in economic clout and money? Are you trusting in medical knowledge? Are you trusting in political power, in armies, and in strength? Look, over the next 11 months, we are going to hear so much about the power of the presidency. It is going to become nauseating. The power of one person, one office. In this election year, we will be told it is the most important election ever. Again. It's like last time, and the time before, and the time before, and the time before. And we will be tempted, as we are every four years, to believe it. To think it really does matter for all of eternity. That, that, that our dependence requires our president to win. No. No, our belief is in God, who is over any human president, any earthly king. We cannot put our hope in human rulers. All right, let's not buy the lie over the next year. Yes, of course, go ahead, vote, engage in politics. Pick the candidate you think will do the job best. 
that's great, that's fine. I'm just telling you, don't put your hope and your heart into that person or the outcome of that election. We don't trust in human rulers or earthly kingdoms to save us. They come and they go. Assyria came and Assyria went. The kingdom of USA has come. Give it enough time, it's probably going to go like every other kingdom has gone. Only God rules forever. This is a good Christmas story, right? We regularly cover this one in Advent. So what does destroying 185,000 Assyrian military fighters and defending Jerusalem have to do with Christmas? Well, about 700 years later, Judah and Jerusalem find themselves in trouble again. This time, they are under the oppressive thumb of Rome. And many Jews are once again praying the prayer that Hezekiah prayed, God, won't you come down and help us? Won't you save us? Won't you get rid of Romans? Won't you free us from this subjugation? God, will you not come and crush our enemies? Free us from our captors. And God did. God did do something in response to these prayers. And he didn't send a senior VP angel. He came himself. God himself God the Son becomes a human being to become the long-awaited Savior, the Messiah, the one who would establish God's mighty and eternal kingdom on earth for his people. Except he didn't come quite the way that they were expecting or hoping. They were looking for a conquering king, not a crying child. He didn't come in glory, but in grace. He didn't come in power, but in humility. He said he did this because his kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom does not function the way earthly kingdoms do. See, Jesus did not actually come to kick the Roman enemies out. Instead, God came for the greater enemy. God went for the deeper problem, one that didn't just affect Israel, but one that affected all human beings. Son of God came down to disarm, to defeat, and to destroy the spiritual forces of this world that hold every human being captive to sin and death. Jesus came to overthrow the spiritual kingdom that we are all enslaved to. He came for the deeper, bigger problem, the great enemy of our sin and our death. Our greatest problem is sin. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible uses that word sin to describe missing the mark, falling short of God's perfect and holy standard. The Bible says we have all sinned. We have all chosen to reject the God of love and life in some way. And therefore, by default, we are choosing the opposite. We choose self-centeredness and death. And this is a great threat that we all face. That great enemy of sin and death leaves no one untouched. When sin and death love to send us threatening messages, don't they? Dissuading us, telling us, don't you trust in Yahweh. You're going to be mine always. You belong to sin. You don't have a prayer. You don't have hope. Don't trust in God to save you because he can't and he won't. Oh, the whispers of sin have been echoing in human ears for centuries. And then, out comes God. Out of heaven, coming to earth to save and rescue our people. And God's word, even through Hezekiah, encourages our hearts. We will trust in the Holy One of Israel, in Yahweh, our God. That is where we need to put our hope. We need to trust, as Hezekiah did, we need to call out to the Lord Call out to him because he alone can deliver us. He alone can deliver us from the kingdom of darkness because he alone is the king of kings. He alone rules forever. All other kingdoms come and go, but God rules forever. And that leaves every single one of us with a decision. Each of us has to decide, will we trust God? Or will we trust something else? Anything else? 
Will we trust his rule? Will we submit to him as king and follow him? Or will we go our own way? Will we choose our own path? Will we follow the Son of God as our king? Will we submit our lives to him? Or will we declare ourselves to be kings and queens of our own life? And require everyone else to submit to us. I encourage you, friends, if you've never trusted in Jesus, he is the path to freedom. There is no other way to be saved, the Bible tells us. It is only to call on Jesus. He alone is trustworthy because he alone is perfectly good and sovereign. When threats come, we can turn to him. When sin threatens us, we turn to him. When death threatens us, we turn to him. When people, when problems, when life circumstances are crowding in on us, we turn to him. He will show up. Now, he might not always show up in the exact way that we want, but he will always show up. If he doesn't free us from the pain, at the very least, he promises to be with us in the pain. Never will he leave us nor forsake us, so we can trust in him, no matter what. He is the God who rules over all things. You know, I showed you that image of my friend's phone earlier, that one with the ballistic missile threat. Well, I only showed you the top half of the image. Here's what his whole phone looked like. He actually had a Bible verse underneath it on the front of his screen. It says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you, 1 Peter 5, 7. Because all other kingdoms, Hawaiian, American, North Korean, all other kingdoms will come and go. We can trust in our God who rules forever. So I encourage you, friends, trust him. Cast your anxiety on him as Hezekiah did. He is trustworthy. So there we were back in 2012, thankful to have a diagnosis, thankful to hopefully reduce the amount of diapers that we were going through in the Custer household, and we were unsure as to how to handle the news of her condition, so we didn't know what to do, so we prayed. We turned to God, we asked him for help, we asked him for guidance, we asked him for wisdom. We knew that this was news to us, but it wasn't news to him. And that he had a plan. And y'all, God showed up. And as often is the case, sometimes he comes down from heaven to do the work himself. Sometimes he loves to work through his people. We had some friends in our church uh, named Corey and Denise LaPlante. They stepped up and they stepped into the situation with us. They got their entire life group together and I think even recruited a second life group in the church. They put on this multi-family garage sale to help raise some funds for us to get started with all these weird almond flowers and all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, they helped us buy a, a food processor. They gave us all the proceeds from their garage sale. The Children's Hospital in Denver uh, took a special interest in Olivia because she really was the first case they'd ever had of this condition in the state of Colorado. So in exchange for us going up there and letting them poke and prod her and ask questions every now and then, uh, they gave us a nutritionist on call, completely free, somebody to help us adjust to the meals and the, the diet changes. And that $6,000 bottle of monthly medication, <laughs> well, the National Organization for Rare Diseases heard about our case, and they uh, elected to pick up the tab on that medication. So we didn't have to pay for it. <laughs> I counted out the drips one time about how many drips. I'm like, 30 bucks, 60 bucks, 90 bucks. For like five drips in milk. Like, this is crazy. <laughs> this is $150 glass of milk. And she wouldn't finish it or she'd spill it. Now, thankfully, today, Olivia is doing great. Uh, if you see her eating some sugar today, you don't have to freak out. Uh, if it's her second or third one, maybe slap it out of her hand. Um, her body has grown to the point where her stomach and her intestines can kind of handle and tolerate a little bit more sugar than it could uh, when she was a little baby, so she is doing well, and we, we praise God for that. When I think back to that time, I just know we're never going to forget how God showed up, um, how good he was to us in the midst of the trouble. 
we saw firsthand experience that God is really in charge. He rules forever. He is the king. No one else is. God will save those who call out to him. He came for Hezekiah. He came at Christmas. He came to rescue us from sin and death. Surely he can handle our smaller problems too. He is the king of kings, my friends. He is the Lord of lords. All other kingdoms will come and go. Only God will rule forever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do give you all glory. We recognize there are many in this world who choose to follow other deities. Lord, there's other deities that lay claim to be wise, to be able to show us the way. God, only you came down to not just show us the way, but you became our way to salvation. You didn't tell us, hey, get on up here to heaven. Here's this ladder to climb. Lord, because you know in my heart I could not have gotten there. No human being could ever reach you with good works. Lord, you had to come down to us. I thank you that you came to rescue and to save. I thank you that no matter what we face, we can trust in you, trust in your plan, trust that somehow in some way you can bring about good and victory in any situation. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for coming at Christmas for our rescue. We worship you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We pray this in your name.